there are a lot of genetic factors, there are a lot of social determinants of health that can make it more challenging to change our diet, to change lifestyle, but there's still a lot within our control and it can have absolutely enormous impact on improving our health. Hi there, it's Claudia, and I'm super excited to invite you to my free training on achieving peak performance and increasing longevity without burning out. Even if you're short on time or dealing with health issues, this is for you. As a peak performance and longevity coach, I've helped entrepreneurs and business professionals like you accomplish more while enjoying vibrant energy to live their best life. If you're ready to unlock your peak potential, grab the training, a free training, by signing up at llpeak.com today. Plus, I have a special gift for you just for joining. So don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. Just go to llpeak.com. That's L-L-P-E-A-K dot com today. See you there. My guest today is Dr. Joanne Manson, world-renowned endocrinologist, epidemiologist, and principal investigator for the Women's Health Initiative, the landmark study on HRT or hormone replacement therapy and potential risk to breast cancer, which came out about over 20 years ago. Joanne is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Chief of the Division of Preventative Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Manson has published over 1,200 scientific articles and is recognized as one of the most cited researchers in the field of medicine. She's won countless awards and is the Editor-in-Chief of Contemporary Clinical Trials, to name but a few of her many accomplishments. Welcome to the Longevity and Lifestyle podcast, Joanne. I am honored and have such a pleasure to welcome you on today. It's great to be here, Claudia. Wonderful to talk with you. I'm very excited for our conversation too, because it's on such an important topic for women. um, And we're going to cover a few different areas, but I'd love to start with women's health and HRT. And for those unfamiliar, HRT is hormone replacement therapy, which is for some controversial. Um, also based on a study that um, our specialist uh, Joanne here today was um, involved with. And so we're going to dig into that shortly. But as my um, audience who have listened to several of different episodes and, and some of my previous guests will be aware of that there is a spectrum of understanding around the benefits of HRT, particularly anecdotal about how it helps um, women going through the perimenopausal, menopausal, and postmenopausal years. Um, Insight from biological age testing company, uh, Glycan Age, Nicolina Lauk, who's been a repeat guest, um, they have uh, 20 plus years of research around glycans and biological age testing and it has shown that that one year when before menopause is declared so basically for the day of your last period waiting one year and a day for menopause to be declared that biologically on average without HRT women are aging biologically on average by eight years so that lack and drop of estrogen is really having an impact on them based on the research and clinical trials that they have been doing So, Joanne, before we dig into the landmark study that you were involved with over 20 years ago, how, in your view, is HRT able to reduce chronic diseases such as heart disease? And how has your view changed perhaps before the study and after the study? Well, the pendulum has been swinging a lot on this topic. But the way we look at it with menopausal hormone therapy, timing is everything. In the early days, let's say 30, 20, 30 years ago, it was believed that women could initiate, you know, for the first time, start taking hormone therapy at age 60, 70, even 80 for the purpose of preventing heart disease, and it would be protective to the heart. We now know that that isn't the case. However, the earlier in menopause, you start, the better the benefit risk profile and hormone therapy serves a purpose for women who have moderate to severe menopausal symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, disrupted sleep, other symptoms of menopause, hormone therapy is very effective and the benefit risk ratio 
is very favorable, especially within the 10 years after onset of menopause. So we generally um, do believe that hormone therapy, if there's an indication for treatment, such as moderate to severe or bothersome, hot flashes, other menopausal symptoms, that women should be able to have shared decision-making with their clinician to decide if hormone therapy is the right choice for them. One big problem is that women often have so much trouble finding a clinician who can have that decision with them. But we really do not recommend hormone therapy for the express purpose of trying to prevent cardiovascular events, such as heart attack, stroke, um, heart failure. The, The evidence is really controversial still. Um, Even in early menopause, is that really a main benefit of hormone therapy? We know oral um, hormone therapy increases risk of blood clots. Probably not the case with the transdermal patch or gel. But we think that um, the thinking about hormone therapy should be very reasonable uh, clinical role in management of menopausal symptoms. but not used for the express purpose of trying to prevent the heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and cancer, that that overall, it's really not for uh, the express purpose of prevention of uh, chronic diseases. So let's jump into this study, Joanne. And you were one of the principal investigators on the Women's Health Initiative study um, 20 plus years ago um, to better understand the effect of HRT when used for chronic diseases prevention. Um, And please correct me on anything that I might (laughs) have misinterpreted here. Can you share more about for people listening? Because a lot was based for many years, and and even to this day, the way thinking is around HRT. Can you share more about the intention of the study, why it was prematurely stopped, and how the misinterpretation of results came about that has caused such a uh, change in perception, if you will, at the time about the use of HRT and the association with a perceived uh, increase in breast cancer? So the purpose of the Women's Health Initiative, the largest randomized trial of menopausal hormone therapy ever done, was to test the role of hormone therapy in the prevention of chronic diseases, such as heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, cognitive decline, cancer, osteoporotic fracture, and all-cause mortality. That was its purpose, and that's why women were enrolled over a broad age range, age 50 to 79, because at least in the United States, and I think uh, many other countries, women were being started on hormone therapy um, well into menopause, often women in their 60s and 70s were being started or restarted on hormone therapy. If they had used it briefly for symptoms, they might be started again at age 65 or or 70. So that was the main purpose. It was stopped early because at least for combination estrogen plus progestin, it was found that the risks outweighed the benefits when it came to chronic disease prevention. There was an increased risk of stroke, blood clots in the legs and lungs, because it was an oral estrogen. It was the most common formulation of estrogen in combination with progestin. So it it was not showing benefits for prevention of chronic disease overall, but it did have certain specific benefits. It did decrease the risk of osteoporotic fractures by about one third and decrease hip fractures in particular and decrease the risk of type two diabetes. And there were some benefits for all cause mortality. It was very neutral, overall, very neutral. But what we noticed as we delve more deeply into the data Um, was that the women who were closer to the onset of menopause at the time of randomization to hormone therapy, 
did better on hormones than the women who were in older age groups. So in particular, the women who were 70 and older tended to have the greatest excess number of heart attack strokes, blood clots, and uh, cases of cancer, and all the way down the line, their risks tended to exceed the benefits. Whereas women who were in their 50s tended to have pretty neutral results for estrogen plus progestin, but they still had some risks. I mean, they still had an increased risk of blood clots, Again, that may be due to the oral estrogen, may not be seen with transdermal. They did have a signal for increased risk of a breast cancer. Now, the results for estrogen alone in women with hysterectomy were much more neutral and even favorable for the younger women. Um, we found that the women in their 50s did have a um, significant reduction in heart attack. With estrogen alone, it was uh, just borderline for total coronary heart disease. They did have, or at least a signal for um, some coronary benefit, but they also uh, did have signals for increased risk of blood clots in the legs and um, stroke. With estrogen alone, there was a decreased risk of breast cancer across all age groups. This may be because the uh, type of estrogen tested, the conjugated estrogen alone, without the addition of a progestogen, um, was having a, what, what, what's called a serum like effect, almost like a tamoxifen type effect. And so overall, there was a signal for reduction in breast cancer. This has to be looked at closely with other formulations of estrogen alone, but it suggests that the addition of a progestin or a progestogen is the major contributor to the risk of breast cancer seen um, with hormone therapy. So I think that we can say that overall, the um, risks of estrogen plus progestin were somewhat greater than the risks of estrogen alone. And that in um, women more distant from onset of menopause, the risks tended to outweigh the benefits, whereas for women closer to onset of menopause, especially for estrogen alone, it was quite a favorable um, benefit risk profile. So for women listening who are maybe, let's say, perimenopausal, um, and considering that, and I think you touched on an important point also about finding the right clinician, the right physician to actually have this conversation with, because unfortunately, this is not widespread knowledge. But assuming they're able to find a hormone specialist who is familiar, and they, these women are perhaps anxious about embarking on an HRT therapy, would you say that, um, you know, what are the type of conversations these women should be having with their hormone specialist in order to best understand if it is beneficial for them in their um, menopausal years? So it is really important that women feel comfortable discussing menopause with their clinicians. And they need to be able to find a clinician who's knowledgeable about menopause and open to having a discussion about their symptoms, the chronic disease risks that do tend to increase at time of menopause and the treatments that are available, which include both hormonal and non-hormonal treatments. So um, if they have trouble finding clinicians in the United States, there is a website, menopause.org, where they can actually find a clinician, uh, put in their zip code and find a clinician who has um, additional expertise in, in menopause. That's a, a North American Menopause Society a website may be helpful, at least in the United States. We'll, we'll link it in the show notes as well. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So women need to feel comfortable talking about their symptoms. Are, are they having hot flashes? How often are the hot flashes? How distressing or bothersome are the hot flashes? Are they having night sweats? Are they wakening at night? Is their sleep disrupted? Are they having brain fog, difficulty concentrating, mood swings? These are all symptoms that can be related to menopause and can be related to disrupted sleep. Now, under these circumstances, if these symptoms are bothersome, 
a woman close to the onset of menopause is likely to be a good candidate for hormone therapy unless she has a high risk of cardiovascular disease or estrogen-sensitive cancers, such as breast cancer and endometrial cancer and the like. But most women who are at usual risk of these conditions, low or moderate risk, and they have bothersome hot flashes, night sweats, other menopausal symptoms, will have a favorable benefit risk profile for use of hormone therapy. Now, if they don't, there are other options for them. There are non-hormonal treatments such as the SSRI, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressants, the serotonin norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, the SNRIs, also the gabapentin-like medications. And there's a new FDA-approved medication that works directly in the brain on thermostat in the brain, um, which also has been shown to be effective. So there are non-hormonal options, which it's important women be aware of, because if they're not a good candidate for hormone therapy, let's say they have prior history, personal history of breast cancer, um, or very strong family history of breast cancer, they want to avoid hormones, there are non-hormonal treatments for them. Also, if they've already had a heart attack or have multiple risk factors for heart disease, they certainly should not be on oral estrogen in pill form. They may be a candidate for transdermal patch gel estrogen, but they may want to avoid estrogen under those circumstances if they have a, a, a high risk of cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. No, that's helpful. Joanne, what's your view on the bioidentical versus synthetic formulations of HRT? It's really important for women to understand that there are the FDA or government approved formulations of bioidentical hormone therapy and also the synthetic hormone therapy that's not bioidentical, um, as, as well as what's called the custom compounded bioidentical hormone therapy. And women should tend to choose the government approved or FDA approved formulations of bioidentical or other hormone therapy, because those are the types of hormone therapy that have been well tested for both efficacy and safety. And if they use the compounded form that is not FDA approved, there is less regulatory oversight in terms of, is it truly effective? Are they getting the content that they think they're getting, you know, in terms of the amount of estrogen or progesterone? And is it, is it free of contaminants and impurities? They, they don't have a guarantee of that as they do with a government regulated, government approved formulation. But bioidentical approved forms, regulated forms of estrogen, estradiol, and um, progesterone, micronized progesterone are very good options and even have advantages over the, let's say, the oral formulations that may be um, like the conjugated, the oral conjugated estrogens or the synthetic progestins. Um, First, these are the transdermal estradiol is safer in terms of not going directly to the liver, not increasing clotting factors. Um, it has, in observational studies, been linked to um, a more neutral effect on blood clots, you know, n- not seeing the increased risk that's been seen with the pill form that goes through the liver and can increase clotting factors. So I think that there are a lot of advantages. Also, micronized progesterone in observational studies has not been linked to as much of an increase in breast cancer as the medroxy progesterone acetate MPA tested in the Women's Health Initiative. 
So I, I certainly wouldn't discourage use of bioidentical estradiol, micronized progesterone. Um, if it's FDA approved, I think it's a very good um, formulation. These are good formulations to use. And also I t- would tend to encourage women to choose transdermal patch gel spray, you know, type of FDA approved products um, rather than the oral estrogens, which have been linked to increased risk of blood clots. But some women prefer oral. And if a woman is in early menopause and generally good health, and she really has a preference for the pill form of estrogen, she should still have a good uh, benefit risk profile with that. Excellent. And also, I know, um, dear audience, you are around the world. And so in different countries, they they call it bioidentical and on others, it's called body identical. But it's when the formulations are regulated or approved versus when they are made up in the pharmacy, if you will. So just to make sure if anyone's listening and looking into it to make sure that they are from one of the approved compounds be it from the FDA or elsewhere around the world. Could I just provide a clarification on that? When when they say bioidentical, they're referring to the estradiol Mm -hmm. or progesterone that is very similar, if not identical, to what the woman naturally produces, Mm -hmm. but it may not be in approved form. She still have to check that it's FDA or government regulated. and then there are all, all of these hormones are basically synthesized. And testosterone as well, right? I mean, there's a, a tosa for, yeah. They're all, they're all basically synthesized in a laboratory of some sort. But the, for, for example, the conjugated estrogens are different from what a woman, you know, naturally makes. They're in fact, the, the conjugated estrogens is more similar to what a female horse, you know, the pregnant mare um, yeah. <laughs> says. Uh, so th- that doesn't mean it's it's not a good a formulation because it has been extensively tested. And in younger women, you know, that formulation of conjugated estrogen um, especially when used alone without a synthetic synthetic progestin, actually had a, a good benefit risk profile for the younger women, not not for um, women you know who were decades past onset of menopause. Thank you for clarifying. Joanne, I have a question for you also around timing. Um, I know that based on the study, you were looking at women sort of um, early 50s up to, I think you said late 70s. Um, and is there a too early time frame to start HRT? I know that for different women, menopause um, can come a bit earlier. I think they'd say the average age is around 51 years old, but people's experiencing perimenopausal symptoms, change in sort of cognition, more brain fog, maybe even hot flashes already. Is that a time to already look at HRT as a support for um, helping with these symptoms? That's a great question, Claudia. Um, most of the randomized trials of hormone therapy, menopausal hormone therapy, have been done among women in menopause who are at least one year past mm-hmm. their last menstrual period, their final menstrual period. Yes. So there's actually very little known about the benefit risk profile of starting hormone therapy earlier in the perimenopause or during the menopause transition. But certainly, um, a woman who is very symptomatic and if her she already has evidence from some laboratory tests like the estradiol level and the follicle stimulating hormone level are consistent with going beginning to go through menopause or early menopause, um, many clinicians will start to treat at that point. Another distinction I, I want to mention is women who go through menopause at an early age, If, for example, they have what's called premature menopause or onset of menopause before age 40, or even early menopause, which is between 40 and 45, those women may particularly benefit from the use of hormone therapy, menopausal hormone therapy, because that early loss of estrogen and the decline in the ovarian hormones at an early age 
has been particularly linked to an increased risk of heart disease, other cardiovascular outcomes, cognitive decline, osteoporosis, and um, some other adverse health outcomes. So I think clinicians uh, may want to treat women who have early or premature menopause and don't have contraindications. You know, they don't have prior history of cancer, estrogen sensitive cancer, that type of contraindication may want to particularly uh, consider the use of hormone therapy in that clinical scenario. But it's important that they understand the randomized trials have not been testing that specific scenario of early premature menopause starting the hormones um, in a woman in her 30s or early 40s. It's almost entirely um, after a more typical age of, of menopause, women who are age 50, you know, 48, 50, um, or, or older than that. That's usually what's been mm-hmm. seen in the trial. So, yeah, I think it's a conversation for someone to have, right, in that circumstance with their clinician and, I guess, just keep an eye on biomarkers and see how the um, impact is and the benefits um, and keep an eye on any potential risks as they go along. Um, is there a time to stop? Would you say, has there been research around um, women taking HRT for menopause and then after 10 years, 15 years, like wh- is there an ideal time when women should be stopping with HRT? So there's a lot of controversy and debate about how long um, is best to be on hormone therapy. We've generally said that the risk of breast cancer with estrogen plus progestin begins to increase around four to five years of use. Um, Generally, there's an encouragement for clinicians to try to reduce the hormone therapy or, or stop the hormone therapy in that period of time if a woman is no longer symptomatic and and she's very receptive to stopping hormone therapy but there is no magic age or duration of hormone therapy where a woman has to stop at that particular age or time period it is a very individualized decision it depends on first how well is she doing on the hormone therapy is she feeling, you know, much better than she was without the hormone therapy? Does she have a a very um, good sense of well-being? Is she free of adverse effects of the hormone therapy? And if she starts to reduce the amount, does she, you know, restart uh, the symptoms, the symptoms restart? Does she become, you know, really symptomatic and unhappy? Uh, That might be a woman where you continue, you know, much longer. Um, Also, it's important to take into account the underlying health status of the woman. She's very healthy. She may be able to stay on longer than a woman who's developing several chronic health conditions like diabetes, heart disease, other forms of cancer. You know, you may want to try to avoid um, hormone therapy under, under those or continuing hormone therapy um, longer under those circumstances. So it's a highly personalized, individualized decision that is made with the woman herself and the clinician, you know, shared decision making. And it will depend on how significant the symptoms were, whether they're re- reappearing after trying to stop and her, just her general health. Also, there's the question of osteoporosis. Um, if a woman, for example, has an increased risk of osteoporotic fracture and she's doing very well on hormone therapy, she's at very low risk of breast cancer and heart disease and some of these other health conditions that you would worry about with increasing or continuing long-term hormone therapy, she may, that type of patient may be a good candidate for longer term treatment. Joanne, I have a, a question for you a little bit on the personal, um, for, for me to better understand as well. So before we we started our conversation, we were talking offline. And um, as I mentioned to you, I'm taking part in some clinical research. I'm 41. 
Um, I had my hormones tested using the Dutch test and my estrogen levels were low. My testosterone was also non-existent. So I started on estradiol and um, a um, body identical or bioidentical testosterone as well, very small doses, transdermal. Um, noticed definitely a benefit in it. Um, my glycan age test result, which is the biological age testing, reduced by three years. So I've gotten down to a biological age of 26 years old now. I'm trying to get it down to 20. <laughs> the estrogen is helping, right? So all this in the name of biohacking <laughs> and science. You gotta be careful. Um, you gotta be a teenager again. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm okay with that, right? Um, but it's it's I definitely noticed personally anecdotally anecdotally. I'm obviously doing other things and cold therapy and all these other wonderful things, etc. But so it's always hard to just pinpoint one thing. But I do definitely notice a difference in that, particularly with the testosterone, because it was pretty much non-existent, but obviously the estrogen is beneficial as well. And through my tracking of sleep, right, I wear an aura ring, um, which obviously isn't always perfect, but it shows that my REM sleep is so low. And so what's thought to support REM sleep is progesterone and a progesterone hormone replacement therapy as well. Would you say that the benefits of obviously, and I know this is maybe an area, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the sleep dynamic of things, but I know you're a brain, brain health specialist as well, but of taking progesterone as well as the estrogen, um, the benefits are larger in order to repair that, that REM sleep, which for me is pretty much always at a one to 2% of my sleep at night, or are the risks um, because of the combination of estrogen and, and progesterone too high that it's better to avoid the progesterone? So we recommend that any woman who has an intact uterus mm -hmm. take a, if she's going to be on hormone therapy, she should take a combination of estrogen and a progestogen in order to protect the uterus from endometrial cancer, endometrial hyperplasia. And a woman who's had hysterectomy, she can be on estrogen alone. Now, does the addition of a progestogen help with sleep? Yes, there is quite a bit of evidence for that. Would I recommend that a woman who's had hysterectomy and would not otherwise need to add a progestogen, that she add that for the purpose of assistance with sleep. I would probably say, no, it may not be worth the trade-off because of some of the concerns, health concerns about the added um, progestogen. However, I think, again, that is an individual decision um, and that if it's micronized progesterone, you know, the evidence from observational studies and randomized trials have not been done of the other formulations of progest progestogens. But the observational studies suggest less of an increase in breast cancer with micronized progesterone than, than with Provera or MPA. Um, so she might make that decision based on her own personal circumstances together with the doctor, you know, discussing all the benefits and risks in her individual, you know, circumstances. But generally, I would not recommend. And a woman who could take estrogen alone uh, because of hysterectomy is probably advisable to just stay with the estrogen without the addition of a okay. progesterone. Yeah. So I will get on to it <laughs> to make sure I have the progesterone then as well. Um, what areas would you say are really still missing? Where are the biggest gaps in research around HRT and women's health in general? Where do you see the biggest need at the moment? So I started out by saying when it comes to menopausal hormone therapy, timing is everything. I think we need more research on the cognitive effects of estrogen and hormone therapy. Women who are in early menopause and particularly women who are symptomatic with hot flashes, night sweats, disrupted sleep, are there in fact some cognitive benefits of but taking a hormone therapy or is it just neutral? Um, we are seeing in most of the randomized trials that in terms of cognition, if a woman is in early menopause or below the age of 60, the effects of hormone therapy on cognition and memory tend to be neutral. There, there does not appear to be an increased risk of cognitive decline in the randomized trials looking at cog cognition, in 
fairly great detail um, according to the age of the woman at time of randomization. However, in women who were 65 and older in the WHI memory study, there was an increased risk of dementia and cognitive decline among you know, the women who are randomized to hormone therapy compared to placebo, especially for combination estrogen plus progestin. So with cognition, it does appear that timing is relevant, you know, that age is a factor just as it seems to be for heart disease. Um, But we don't have a lot of data on how this, the benefit risk profile of hormone therapy is affected by whether the woman has hot flashes, night sweats, disrupted sleep, because it may be that women who are symptomatic, um, especially with disrupted sleep, may be most susceptible to some cognitive, adverse cognitive effects from these symptoms because their sleep is disrupted and they may benefit the most from taking hormone therapy um, and but right now there isn't a clear message such as oh if you're having those symptoms you really should seriously consider hormone therapy because it may be protective of cognition we don't yet have enough data to be able to say that but I think there's a gap in knowledge women would really benefit from having more research on that particular subject. I think we also need more research on the effects of different formulations of hormone therapy. Um, Even in terms of breast cancer, you know, there are some surrogate markers such as mammographic breast density that maybe could be used to see if there are differences between estradiol and conjugated estrogen, different progestogens, micronized progesterone versus um, medroxy, progesterone acetate and other uh, types of progestins. I think we need more research on the effects of different formulations of hormone therapy on mammographic breast density. And ultimately, the risk of breast cancer is the, you know, an endpoint of great importance, but it takes very, very large trials, randomized trials to look at you know, that, that end point. That's why the Women's Health Initiative was 17,000 women, you randomize to either estrogen plus progestin or placebo and nearly 11,000 additional women randomized to estrogen alone or placebo. Overall, there's more than 27,000 women in the WHI hormone therapy trial. And these are obviously very, very large endeavors. Um, It's not going to be possible to do a trial of that magnitude for every formulation of estrogen and combined with every formulation of a progestogen. But we, we can look at intermediate markers. We can look at surrogate markers, imaging studies. We can do more with cognitive testing, you know, trials that are are testing memory change and cognition change. So I think more can be done even with smaller randomized trials. But the trials, the randomized clinical trials are so important for getting really clear answers, rigorous answers for women. To understand. Thank you for sharing that. And just um, on the cognitive aspect as well, it was interesting. I've had uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who I'm sure you're familiar with his work. He's at, of the Buck Institute. He's a neuroscientist. Um, his um, very popular book, The End of Alzheimer's Program, um, which really helps people to understand and in his view that he has uncovered 38 different drivers of neurodegenerative diseases, and one of which is um, low estrogen levels, particularly for women. And so my mother, who suffers from dementia, as my audience knows, I I talk about this um, regularly. And um, through the analysis that we did based on Dale Bredesen's protocols, discovered that the lack of hormone replacement therapy and essentially her low estrogen levels, as well as several head trauma events, were the main drivers of her dementia cause. So um, when I did my DNA testing, I have a single copy of the APOE4 gene, but it turns out my mother doesn't have a single copy, yet she's the one with dementia. My father, who has also a single copy, he's fine at 84. So um, 
this is also something through Dale Bredesen's work that has become um, very obvious in terms of understanding estrogen and the impact for cognitive health in later years as well. So just to highlight that point. Claudia here again. Don't miss out. Grab the free training on how to achieve peak performance and increase your longevity without burning out. Just go to llpeak.com today. Some other guests I've had on as well, Joanne, um, are experts in ADHD. And they see a lot of women coming to them sort of late 30s, 40s, saying that they went to their doctor, they're experiencing difficulties focusing concentration. So they're not particularly menopausal yet, but because of fluctuations in hormones through perimenopause, they're going to their doctor saying, I don't know what's going on. And they're saying, well, typically they're offered an antidepressant (laughs) instead of actually having their hormones addressed as well. So are you familiar with research around the incident of increased ADHD or ADD symptoms? So for those maybe unfamiliar, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, if I say it correctly. So the correlation between that and hormone levels. So I'm certainly familiar with ADHD and ADD and that women generally have been perceived as being at lower risk and were not often as often diagnosed with this condition earlier in life. But now there's an improved understanding that women are also very vulnerable to this condition. And the prevalence is quite high in women as well as men. So I think that's progress that this is is being um, detected and, and diagnosed more commonly in, in women than it was in the past. The association with hormone levels, I haven't yet seen that research. I'm very interested in that possibility that um, it it could be linked. But um, I do think this is another area where randomized trials could be so helpful in women, especially as they're beginning the menopause transition, getting into the perimenopause, if they have um, these issues with um, attention deficit hyperactivity or just attention deficit disorder that they could be tested uh, compared to placebo. Is there a benefit? Um, you know, of hormone therapy for these symptoms. I think that that would be very, very important to do. Joanne, I'd like to shift gears and talk about a further research field. I know you're doing many, but one that you cover around um, dietary supplements and separating facts from fiction. Can you share more about a recent study that um, was a randomized trial, I believe, as well on multivitamins and their impact on memory and slowing cognitive aging in older adults? Yes. So in a large randomized trial that we've done, the Cocoa Supplement and Multivitamin Outcome Study, also known as COSMOS, this is overall a trial of 21,000 participants. We have looked at cognition, the effects of these interventions on cognition in two separate ancillary studies. One involved a a very detailed telephone administered uh, cognitive assessment and another a web-based cognitive assessment. And in both of these studies, we saw a clear signal that the participants randomized to multivitamins as opposed to placebo did better on memory and cognitive testing than uh, the participants, they did better than those um, randomized to placebo, which is actually when you think about cognitive tests like this, there's a lot of noise, you know, the um, the noise to signal ratio can be quite high. And despite that noise, this signal did emerge um, that multivitamins were associated with um, greater improvement in memory and cognition uh, than the placebo and, and, and generally better results than the placebo group on these memory tests and cognitive tests. We have one other ancillary study that we're analyzing the data. This involves a very um, gold standard in-person assessment of uh, cognition And um, so we'll be publishing that relatively soon, moving forward with that relatively soon. But it's it's somewhat remarkable that um, in these two separate randomized trials, there would be this signal 
um, for a benefit of the multivitamins. Also, we saw in the in those who started out with low flavanol uh, levels, you know, from the diet, you know, f- foods such as um, fruits, berries, um, apples, you know, pears, the different fruits that are higher in flavanols. Um, and then there's tea and other sources, uh, cocoa products. Uh, those who started out low benefited from the cocoa flavanols in terms of uh, cognition. But the you know we, we are seeing this repeated signal for the multivitamins, and we want to pursue this further with additional um, studies because there's the multivitamins, as you know, they contain uh, just the usual intakes, you know, the daily intake levels. The, these are not mega doses. These are not doses that have been associated with risks or toxicity. They're they're very um, the like the recommended dietary allowances or the daily intake levels, and um, it may be that people who are deficient in one or more of these micronutrients will benefit from taking a multivitamin. We know there are multiple nutrients that are important for brain health. Um, Some of the top candidates have been B12, thiamine, other B vitamins, vitamin D, lutein, magnesium, um, zinc. Uh, There are many, many micronutrients in multivitamins and um, correcting deficiencies in any one or more of these micronutrients may be beneficial for brain health. And I think that this is really promising research and needs to be pursued further because multivitamins, um, they will never be a substitute for a healthy diet or healthy lifestyle. We're not talking about, oh, just throw a multivitamin at a really unhealthy fast food diet with lots of processed foods. No, we're talking about still striving for healthy, balanced diet and healthy lifestyle, physical activity, not smoking, all the things we talk about frequently and are so critically important. But many people may have a low level or even a deficiency of just selected micronutrients and may benefit as a complementary strategy by taking a multivitamin, especially at older ages. Um, And we think that these are are very uh, interesting findings. This was age 60 and older. So these are not really, you know, old adults. This is more like midlife and older adults. And there was this uh, clear signal emerging. So we thought this was quite interesting. Um, This does not mean that taking mega doses of individual nutrients, micronutrients, such as taking really high doses of beta carotene, vitamin E, vitamin C, would be a benefit for brain health or would have a favorable benefit risk ratio. Because in fact, some of these isolated micronutrients have been tested in randomized trials and have not shown benefits for cardiovascular disease, cancer, or cognitive function. Um, We're we're thinking that this may be something that is more specific to a um, multivitamin, multimineral um, supplement that contains the daily intake levels of 20, 30 or more, you know, micronutrients uh, conferring this benefit. Joanne, did the study look at any deficiencies that the participants might have had um, previous to partaking in the trial and, and taking the multivitamins? We have measured the micronutrient levels on only a small subset, and we haven't measured everything. We are seeing First, that the micronutrient levels, such as of vitamin D, of folate, B12, they do increase as would be expected with the amount of the micronutrient in the multivitamin. And that suggests that absorption and bioavailability of the micronutrients tends to be good. We are planning in the future. Of course, all of this takes, you know, funding and money. Um, 
hope to look at a much larger number of nutrient levels at baseline and follow up and um, also look at things like um, epigenetics, DNA methylation changes and whether aging um, is, is affected in terms of that marker of biological aging, as well as telomere length and many other biomarkers uh, for aging. Mm, beautiful. Joanne, what are some of the most harmful myths in your view about dietary supplements? I know a lot of people here like, oh, supplements, you know, there's an, is there any nutrients in them at all, et cetera. So what are some things you would warn people about in terms of just in general dietary supplements? First, I want to emphasize again, even though I already said it, that dietary supplements will never be a substitute for a healthy diet. It shouldn't, they should not be perceived that way, but rather as a complementary strategy. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, more is not necessarily better. Uh, it, in fact, it can be worse. And mega dosing on a single isolated micronutrient uh, could interfere with the absorption and the bioavailability of other micronutrients, particularly related micronutrients. For example, if you take beta carotene in very high doses in the randomized trials, that was linked to an increased risk of lung cancer in smokers. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has clear guidelines now not to take supplements, you know, to really avoid taking high dose supplements of beta carotene or vitamin E. Vitamin E um, also was found to increase risk of hemorrhagic stroke in, in high doses. We're talking mega doses, not the amount that is recommended because these are really essential for good health, but only a small amount is needed. More is not necessarily better and avoid mega dosing. Those are other really important points. Also, I think... Um, the need for these supplements is um, individual, you know, really needs to be individualized assessments. It can depend on life stage. We know that um, it's really important for women who, during pregnancy to take prenatal vitamins. That's so important for a healthy pregnancy and to avoid the neural tube defects. But also prior to conception, you really don't want to delay taking um, these vitamins until you're into a second trimester in a pregnancy. So if a woman is, if, for example, if she is a reproductive age and is not taking, you know, contraception, using contraception, really avoiding pregnancy, it's not a bad idea to be taking a multivitamin just to be sure it's on board at the time of conception. The American Academy of Pediatrics has certain guidelines for some vitamins, um, you know, vitamin D, iron, you know, breastfeeding uh, infants up until a certain age. I, I'm not a pediatrician. I'm an endocrinologist, adult medicine endocrinologist. So I, I won't talk further about pediatric guidelines. But um, I think we already know certain life stages uh, prior to conception, during pregnancy, lactation, um, at older ages where calcium, vitamin D, can be achieved through, especially calcium, we're recommending more just trying to get it through the diet. Um, but some people do need supplements of um, vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, uh, certainly if they're underlying health conditions, B12 deficiency, um, that can happen with pernicious anemia, with um, different medications that can interfere with the absorption, like um, anticonvulsant medications, tuberculosis treatments can interfere with absorption um, and metabolism um, of some of these micronutrients. And people who have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, um, gastric bypass surgery, they may have some malabsorption, fat malabsorption, and need to take higher amounts of these micronutrients. And not only a multivitamin, but even additional supplementation of some of these um, micronutrients. Macular degeneration is another example. There's some evidence that um, in randomized trials that adding certain um, types of vitamins and minerals can be helpful to slow progression 
of macular degeneration, the ARIDS-2 trial, for example. There are supplements on the market for macular degeneration. So the decision needs to be individualized. It can relate to, uh, for multivitamins, it, it may be more broad, especially in older age groups, but for some of the other micronutrients, it may relate to life stage, certain age age groups um, may, may particularly benefit, and also underlying health status, people who have certain health conditions um, or are taking certain medications may particularly benefit from uh, taking these supplements. Would you say there's certain supplementation for helping to optimize female hormones and female hormone health? So the interaction between micronutrients and hormones has not been extensively studied, um, e even in terms of healthy diet, you know, general composition of the diet in relation to hormonal status and menopausal symptoms, very, very limited research on this question. But I actually do agree that more research is needed. Certain types of dietary factors have been studied for reducing hot flashes, night sweats, you know, soy products um, are effective in some individuals, but not in others. Um, you know, it, it does depend on how you metabolize um, soy products. So there are genetic factors that can influence that. Um, but but overall, diet has been minimally studied in, in terms of um, menopausal symptoms and interrelationship with estrogen levels, uh, de the declining estrogen levels during the menopause transition and um, menopause and more research would be very valuable on that subject. Joanne, a question I ask all my guests um, of late is that if you could live to 150 years old with excellent health, how would you spend your time? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I well, right now, maybe for the, the next five, 10 years, you know, I, I'm really enjoying kind of the, the balance of working and spending time with my family and um, trying to make time for a lot of different things, you know, uh, being with friends, family, a, as well as work. I think if I could live to 150, I'd probably w work a little longer, but not much longer. Uh, I have... Uh, I, I think keeping your mind active is always tremendously important and um, learning new things. I, I would just really enjoy having more time to delve more deeply into some topics that um, I haven't had a chance to, in, in, including, you know, more in both the science and non-science fields, I'm uh, tremendously interested in history. Um, I, I would be really interested in learning more, having having opportunities to do more recreational leisure, time reading. Um, I, I would say most importantly, I'd want to spend time with my children and eventually grandchildren as much as they're willing to uh, spend with me. <laughs> of course, they're going to have their own priorities. But I would say if I could live that long I would really want to be spending most of the time with family and friends and um, personal interactions, but also just, you know, trying to um, keep my mind active, learning new things, exciting, exciting new things, and um, even kind of keeping a hand in medicine, um, you know, in terms of the science and the scientific research. I probably wouldn't be as actively involved in, you know, the actual randomized trials and um, the day-to-day -day activities of the research, but I would want to really keep up on it. Beautiful. Joanne, what excites you most about the future of health and well-being and longevity over the coming years and beyond? As you probably have guessed, I, I'm a very strong proponent of testing the effectiveness, you know, uh, of different interventions in randomized trials. So that's what 
really gets me excited about science. Actually, if something looks promising, I know I think all these forms of research are so critically important. You need the bench research, the basic science research to suggest biological mechanisms, then the observational research to generate hypotheses that Many can of them can be tested in randomized clinical trials. Now, not everything can be tested in a randomized clinical trial. And very often the observational research is just so overwhelming and so compelling. You know, examples would be cigarette smoking. We don't need randomized trials to tell us that that's very bad for health and people should stop or never start um, smoking. But, um, you know, for many dietary factors, for many other medications, interventions, um, the the randomized trials have been very helpful in in understanding um, what really works and what doesn't. And when and even the randomized trials that prove something doesn't work, this often gets um very little attention, you know, the importance of randomized clinical trials that have disproven that some <laughs> an intervention is effective. But think about it. If it's proved by a trial that an intervention is not effective, then it can spare people the risks of the intervention, the expense and costs of the intervention, and it redirects the energy and the scientific investment in other topics, other areas, so they're no longer wasted pursuing something that doesn't work. So I think if there's any scientific question that's worth answering, then the answer is important, whether it's positive, negative, or null. Um, and that does not receive as much attention as it deserves. If people want to find out more about results of randomized clinical trials, where would you point them to? Where is a good resource to find out more? I think if there is a specific intervention that they're really interested in, such as hormone therapy and, and the trials of hormone therapy, um, I think Women in the general public can get a lot from the menopause.org, North American Menopause Society website, because it provides a lot of information about the trials and about the research. And it, it provides, um, you know, short write-ups uh, to help women understand the changes that they experience during menopause and the treatments that are available and all of that. So I think that's a, a very good um, website. I think that clinicaltrials.gov um, is a good website for information about the clinical trials that are out there that are being done. Some of them are being um, are undergoing recruitment still. Others have ended recruitment and the results may be posted, but there's a lot that can be learned uh, from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and generally, if, if there is a specific intervention that you're interested in, you can go to government websites tend to have very reliable information or even searching on some of the um, commercial websites that that are known to be reliable. You do have to look into, you know, it, it can be a little complicated figuring out whether the information is reliable or not. But um you know, there there are websites such as um, WebMD, you know, that that do provide um, reliable information on a lot of topics. I think Wikipedia is not bad for, mm -hmm. for looking. I mean, you obviously have to be a little skeptical, but um, I think there's a, a lot of a process in place for double checking on mm -hmm. on that information, but. Um, Generally, I, I would recommend, if possible, reading the actual article. You know, you can search on PubMed and find the articles, go to the original sources and um, medical societies, the American Heart Association and the European Society of Cardiology. You know, there there are many other um, I, I, I'm 
probably mentioning too many U.S. American. I don't want. I don't want to be U.S. centric here. There are many, many um, other websites uh, that can be very helpful for this purpose that that are in throughout the world um, international websites. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing a researcher told me once I was follow the money, look who funded the study, <laughs> if you want to uh, know how um, biased or unbiased a study might be. Um, so just a word of caution when when doing research on studies as well. To some extent, and, you know, most of my research is government funded, you know, through the National Institutes of Health. But I, I do want to put in just some defense of uh, industry-sponsored research, because I think we need to have that collaboration between industry and academia. And very often the government will, will not fund certain types of trials where they feel that there could be a company, a commercial uh, benefit to a company. And it is so important that the you know pharmaceutical companies and industry be willing to test these products very rigorously. But what's really important is that there be a firewall between the company and the academic researcher and that the results of the research need to be published no matter what, whether they're favorable, unfavorable, or neutral. There can't be an arrangement where the results will be suppressed if they're not favorable for the company. So I, I think if that kind of contract can be worked out and a firewall, um, you know, er erected between academia and uh, industry, that that research can be very credible and very important in, in building the scientific database. Oh, yeah, here's to more of that for sure, so that a lot of research will get funded. Uh, Jennifer Garrison, uh, Professor Jennifer Garrison of the Buck Institute, who you know, is um, you know, looking on ways to optimize funding for women's health research that through what she's doing as well. And the struggle, I mean, she was on the podcast recently, you know, saying that at the moment she spends so much time managing grants and like this one's ending in six months, this one's in 12 months and, you know, trying to juggle, you know, where do I get the grants and, and the funding for that as well. So finding that beautiful model where research can be um, funded over seven, even 10 periods of time, something that she was mentioning is where you get to that Nobel Prize breakthrough uh, worthy um, research um, that hopefully we will <laughs> be able to shift more towards. Shuan, it was such a pleasure speaking today. Where can people learn more about what you're up to um, online um, or websites? Um, and I'll, I'll link everything in the show notes. So I, I, I'm on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, yeah, people can just search on my name. And I do have a website through Brigham and Women's Hospital. You know, if they they search on my name, I think that they will, Dr. Joanne Manson, they will get to one of my websites, which would be either at Brigham and Women's Hospital or the Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health. And they can read more about me there. And um also, there there's information on the on the websites about um the research and if they really want to contact me, <laughs> I don't want to get, a, I already get 550, 600 emails a day. So I don't want to. Okay, but, but, yeah, exactly. To, to allow them, but for, for research purposes, if they're looking for some articles, then on your website, you have um, resources there too. And, and people find my, my email address. So yeah, <laughs> I'll be able to find it if they really, if they really do want to reach me. Yeah. Joanne, do you have a final ask, recommendation, or any parting thoughts or message for my audience today? Well, I I want people to feel empowered to really improve their health, to be able to ask the questions that they have of, for example, their clinician. They need to be able to find a clinician who listens to them and can help them with problem solving. I mostly, I just think it's so important. And I mean, I've decades also of clinical practice experience. And I think uh, it's so important for 
women in particular, because so often they felt that they can't find a clinician to help them with these issues related to menopause and midlife um, health. They do feel that there are clinicians out there. There are strategies for finding a clinician, even if you're just calling a lot of medical centers and asking for women's health specialists and for menopause clinics. Many hospitals and medical centers have established those. And then women need to feel free to talk openly and request shared decision-making with their clinician. And also to understand that um, there is really strong evidence that we can take charge of our own health. You know, there are a lot of genetic factors. There are a lot of social determinants of health that can make it more challenging to change our diet, to change lifestyle. But there's still a lot within our control and it can have absolutely enormous impact on improving our health. Here's to to that as well. Yes. Lifestyle interventions, living our best lives, thriving with lots of energy for longer. So thank you so much, Joanne, for coming on today. It was an absolute pleasure. Wonderful talking with you, Claudia.